Let's go ahead and begin the um, week three live meeting in the introduction to paralegal studies course. And for the meeting this week, we're going to be covering chapters five, six, and ten. And the um, the first chapter five, the sources of American law. If I'm going to work as a paralegal in the in doing legal work, you, um, we want to give you a basis for what is the foundation of our legal system. And it is unique. It is the unique, the most unique system in the world. And the, um, what complicates it even more is the fact that we have 50 separate state jurisdictions that are covered that have their own jurisdiction over the um, over the legal cases and we have a federal system that operates at the same time over all of the state systems so it is complicated and some of it can be kind of confusing now let's start what it what is law anyway and the, um, the authors give you a real short definition, a body of rules of conduct established and enforced by the controlling authority, the government of a society. So the basis of any legal system, if you want to keep it simple, are the rules that a society operates under. Now, specifically in America, what are the primary sources of American law? And there we have four, and they are the case law decided by the courts, the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, and then the Constitution of the various states, the statutory law, which is passed by Congress for federal laws, and by the state legislatures in um, in each individual state and finally the fourth one which you may not be as familiar with but it's just important just as important are the regulations passed by the um the federal agencies and the federal agencies are what you you've heard all of these agencies before and you probably wondered what was their authority the over broadcast television, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, uh, any drugs that are sold in the United States are subject to the FDA. We all are very familiar if we have a job in the IRS. Those are all the federal agencies that, um, that operate in the United States. Now, we have a system that is based on the, the English system. And we've inherited almost all of the English system onto the American system. And the basis for the English system and subsequently the American system is the common law. And the common law is a concept that the courts, when they are rendering a decision in a lawsuit between parties, the decision by the judge is the common law. And the advantage of this concept is that as each case is decided and the judges issue an opinion, the law is going to grow. It's going to change and adapt to, um, to new situations. So the um, it's constantly evolving. And the, to try to keep some uniformity in the common law, we have a concept called stare decisis, which means the thing speaks for itself. In other words, 
judges deciding cases for a lawsuit that they have before them look to prior cases for direction on how to decide the case. And there is the key to legal research. That's why we've made such a big deal about how you research the case law, because that's what you're going to be doing. You're going to be giving the judge the case law that you feel he or she should use to decide your case. So that concept of stare decisis is very important in establishing our common law and um, our, the real basis for um, our legal system. Now, we have a dual concept. In addition to the common law, we also have something called equity. And equity works this way. The cases decided in common law by the judges involve usually the award of damages. The, the sole remedy under common law is the judge gives damages to the defendant and awards a money judgment for either party. The, court, the courts have also jurisdiction called equity. And equity involves if the remedy for just giving damages is not enough, the court has the authority to make the parties do something. And they can issue an order, and one that you may be familiar with is an injunction. And it's an order by the court to one of the parties to do something. And this is what we call the, um, the remedies and equity. Now, the basis for all of our, the whole structure for our legal system starts with um, the, com with the, excuse me, with our Constitution, with the federal U.S. Constitution is the basis for our um, whole, the, the organization of our government, really the whole operation of our legal system. And so it is the final authority for any legal matters in the United States that if a case goes to the Supreme Court of the United States, which is the final court for the United States and renders a decision on our constitution, that is the law of the land. That is the sole law established by the the um, Supreme Court. So the federal constitution really is the basis for everything in our legal structure. And we have an, a unique um, part of our constitution that no other government in the world has, and it's called the Bill of Rights. We have a list, the 10 original Bill of Rights, and there have been additions to that since then. But the unique thing about our Bill of Rights is it specifically says what the government cannot do to us as American citizens. No other country has such a document. And that it is unique throughout the world, and you're familiar with a lot of these you hear them all the time. The government can't come into your house without probable cause or a search warrant. The, you have a right to a jury trial if you're accused of a crime and you're tried for that crime. And you've heard all of them, the freedom of speech, the right to own guns, all of these are contained in the Bill of Rights. So it's one of the very unique situation. Now, I mentioned that we've got 50 state jurisdictions too. We've got the federal, the United States Constitution, but we have various, the 50 state constitutions that are all different and they govern the, they're the final authority within the states. And so 
the, um, in addition to our federal constitution, we have these 50 state constitutions. Now, we discussed the common law where the law is developed through court decisions, but we also have statutory law. And statutory law is the actual statutes that are passed by the US Congress or federal law and the individual state legislatures for state law. So that we have statutes in for federal law and we have state statutes that govern the individual state laws. And finally, I mentioned this that you're not too familiar with is administrative law. And why this is so unique is you, you really haven't heard much about, you know these agencies by name, but really what do they do? And what is interesting about the administrative agencies are they pass rules for the various areas that they have jurisdiction over. An example is the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, comes out with rules about the acceptability of certain drugs and you know what they will accept and what they won't. But in addition to passing the law, the rules, they also enforce them. So they really act as judge and jury. That in other words, if a company or an individual feels that an administrative rule is violating some right that they have, they can appeal, they can file an a action with the administrative agency and the administrative agency will rule whether its rule is valid. So they really have overall authority. Now, the individual who feels that their rights have been violated by an administrative rule, they, um, they have the right to go to court if the decision of the administrative agency is not what to their liking and file a lawsuit to make the administrative agency do what the um, individual is seeking. So they do have a remedy through, um, through the courts. Now, chapter six, we go through the, the various details involving our courts. And one of the, what can we say, landmark or one of the most important powers that our courts have are jurisdiction. And jurisdiction is simply the, the court in question has authority to render a decision over the case before it. That's the court's jurisdiction. Well, if you think about a lawsuit, it's very simple. Someone has, the plaintiff feels that the defendant has done something that damaged them or violated one of their rights, and they want the court to enforce their rights against the defendant. Well, the plaintiff files what's called a complaint to commence the lawsuit. And as you can probably imagine, the defendant disagrees with what the plaintiff is claiming and either denies it or says the plaintiff did something to him or her. So the jurisdiction that the court obtains, the, the basic kind of jurisdiction is jurisdiction over the person. The plaintiff has voluntarily accepted jurisdiction by filing the complaint with the court. The court obtains jurisdiction over the defendant by the plaintiff issuing what's called a summons and the defendant receives the summons and then, I won't go to into too much detail, but can answer the plaintiff's complaint. And that, and once the defendant is served, that's how the court has jurisdiction over the parties, the persons. So now the court can render a decision 
because it has power over these individuals. Now, it's a little more complicated in that the courts have two other types of jurisdiction. And they're different from this standpoint. Generally, lawsuits involve disputes between a person or two companies. That's jurisdiction over the parties, over the persons. If there is a something in, in dispute, and a, a good example of this, the jurisdiction over the party, over the property, excuse me, is a mortgage foreclosure. And the court has jurisdiction over the real estate, not over the parties. The court has jurisdiction to issue a mortgage foreclosure because it has jurisdiction over the property. And that is the um, other jurisdiction the court has. The court has a third type of jurisdiction, and this is a little more complicated, and I, I don't want to get too deep into this. We're going to you'll talk about it in subsequent courses. But just as a simple description, the court can get jurisdiction over the subject matter. And usually what that involves is the plaintiff has a judgment against the defendant. And let's say they've gone through a lawsuit, had their trial, the court has awarded the plaintiff damages in the amount of $10,000. So he gets a judgment for $10,000 against the defendant. Well, the defendant's not gonna write him a check right there for the $10,000. He has to enforce the judgment. And what the plaintiff attempts to do is get jurisdiction over property owned by the defendant to enforce this judgment. And so if the defendant has property real estate or some type of equipment, the plaintiff files an additional action to get jurisdiction over the subject matter owned by the defendant and to pay for his judgment. It's a lot more complicated than that, but let's just leave it at that for now, that um, that's what's jurisdiction over the subject matter. Now, because we have 50 separate state courts, as I mentioned, the jurisdiction over the, in the state courts is over state law. Well, we've got this federal system that operates that is, that is the law for all of the 50 states, for the United States. So that the jurisdiction of federal courts, there's a federal court system, and there's a state court system. The jurisdiction of the federal courts are, are based on two types of jurisdiction. Federal questions, and what that means is the federal court has a case involving a federal statute or a constitutional question. That's what we call federal questions. Those go to the federal courts. But the federal courts also have jurisdiction over state decisions, but they are limited as to the kinds of cases they can take. And again, it's a lot more complicated, but I just want to generally give you an idea of what we're talking about here. A case that's involving two parties from separate states. A citizen of Georgia is suing a citizen of Florida. That is what we call juris diversity of jurisdiction. They are from separate states. The federal courts have jurisdiction over that kind of part, uh, that kind of lawsuit when they are individuals from separate states. And also because everybody'd want to go to the federal courts for their decisions the amount in dispute has to be over 75,000 before it goes to federal court. And that's merely a limitation to prevent everybody from taking their case from state court to um, the federal courts. That's a very simple summation. It's a lot more complicated than that. But um, for our purposes, that's where we want to leave it. 
Now I mentioned there's state courts, the basic courts for the states are the trial courts. That's where cases begin in the, the state system. The state has intermediate appellate courts. The parties to the initial lawsuit can appeal a decision of the trial court to an intermediate court. It's not a new trial. All the intermediate court is going to look at is the legal issues in the trial. So one of the parties feels like the the um, judge didn't render his or her decision based on their interpretation of the law. They in, can appeal to the intermediate appellate court for a decision. Now, in some cases, a party can appeal even if they lose the appellate decision. And it's not entirely a given that their case is going to end up in the state Supreme Court. Only limited kind of cases are going to end up in the state Supreme Courts, and I'm going to mention why in a minute. The federal court system has a similar setup. They call them differently. They're identified differently. The trial courts in the federal court system are called the district courts. And each state, wherever you live, has federal district courts, and they're usually divided by geography. And just because I practice in Florida, as an example, and you can check your state to um, see where the district courts are. We have a northern district that's situated in Jacksonville, Florida. We have a middle district, which is situated in Tampa, Florida, that covers all of Central Florida, Orlando, Daytona Beach. That's the middle district of Florida. And we have a southern district, which is Miami, Fort Lauderdale, all of South Florida. So that it's based on geography. And you can go to your state and find how many district courts you have and how they're divided. <clears throat> Now the federal system has a similar system to the various state systems that you can appeal a decision of the district court to what we call the court of appeals. And that is the intermediate court in the federal system. And the authors give you an example there. The courts of appeal are divided by geography. And if, if you look in the textbook on page 171, there are the various courts of appeal. And you can find your state on there, wherever the jurisdiction of that circuit court of appeals is based on where the district court is located. So if you notice, I'm in Florida, all of our federal cases go to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And you notice if you're in New York State, it's the second. If you're in California, it's the ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. If you're in Texas, it's the fifth Circuit the Court of Appeals. And then of course, the last appeal for any case in the United States is to the Supreme Court. Now, as I mentioned in the state system, you don't get an automatic appeal to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court in the individual states, all of the Supreme Courts in the individual states, and the United States Supreme Court have a way to limit the kinds of cases that come before it. And this is, is a Latin term called a writ of certiorari. And what that means is, if you want an appeal in the state courts from the appellate courts to the Supreme Court, or you want an appeal to the, from the Court of Appeals to the U.S. Supreme Court, you have to file a writ of certiorari with the Supreme Court. 
And what you're saying is you are asking the Supreme Court to decide your case. You haven't appealed it yet. You have an initial step. You have to ask the Supreme Court, can I, will you hear our case? And the Supreme Court turns you down most, and turn the Supreme Courts in the states and the United States Supreme Court turn down most of the cases that are, that they receive a writ of certiorari. So see this way they can limit the types of cases that they want to consider. So that's the use of the writ of certiorari. You have to ask the Supreme Court, will you hear our case? And that way it can limit what the, um, what they will, the kinds of cases they will decide. Now, the, the chapter concludes with a very important part of our legal system today called alternative dispute resolution. And you'll hear it uh, by the, the initials ADR. And alternative dispute resolution is very important in our legal system today. Nobody doubts for a minute. No one would argue that our court systems are jammed. I know in Florida, you are not going, if, if your case is going to trial, you're probably looking at a year before it's decided for a minimum. Maybe sometimes the, it would be better, but you're not gonna get a, decision next week. It's going to be many months and usually a year. Same thing in the federal courts. The courts are jammed with all of these cases, with the lawsuits that they're deciding. The judges are certainly earning the salaries that they're paid. They are large salaries, but believe me, those judges earn the salaries that they're being paid. They're handling hundreds of cases in the trial level and a court, of course, the appellate and Supreme Courts. So recently, legal scholars, lawyers, judges have thought, what is an alternative to these lawsuits, which takes so long, they're expensive, the preparation for a trial is enormous, so what can we do to limit some of these cases going to court? And that's the idea of an alternative dispute resolution. The, the authors give you three or four examples, and I certainly urge you to read those, but the two main types of ADR that are used today are mediation and arbitration. Mediation, I can tell you, is used all over the United States. And I have handled numerous cases through mediation. And why mediation is used in our court system is it works. And how it works is this way. You have two parties who are suing each other. The one party has sued the other. They are at odds, trust me, once the the plaintiff feels he's been wrong, he or she's been wrong. He sues, he or she sues the defendant. The defendant immediately goes on, no pun intended, the defensive. He didn't do anything wrong. She didn't do this, back and forth. The advantage of mediation is the parties can sit down together and they mutually hire a mediator. And this mediator not, is not going to decide their case for them. The mediator is going to help them decide for themselves. And so what happens is in mediation is the mediator talks to one party without the other party present because many times in these lawsuits, you know, there's bad blood, there's name calling, all of this, the mediator gets the plaintiff's side. He then, the plaintiff, and it can have an attorney, 
He then asked the plaintiff's attorney and the plaintiff to leave. The defendant and the defendant's attorney come in, comes in and the mediator hears the defendant's side. Then he gets the parties together. And the secret here is, and some of these mediators are very skillful, believe me, he or she, the mediator, shows the parties, this is what you're going to get. And literally, he can say you're dreaming if you think you're going to get a $100,000 judgment against the defendant. He tells the plaintiff, listen, there's no way you're going to win that much money. You're going to get about $10,000. And so if you think about it, see, now we're getting to the reality of what's going on and it works. And many cases are settled through mediation and they stay out of the courts. Now, the parties always have the option of backing up saying, no, I'm not agreeing to this, we're going to court. So the mediation is to keep the lawsuits out of the court, but the parties always have the option of proceeding to a lawsuit in a court decision. Arbitration is a little different and it's not used as much as mediation because arbitration, the parties actually hire an arbitrator, he or she's called, and they render a decision. So in arbitration, very similar to the mediation, the parties present their case to the mediate, to the arbitrator. But in this case, the arbitrator actually makes the decision for the parties. And they can agree to be bound by that, or they can have the option of going ahead and filing a lawsuit. So that's where the arbitration is different from mediation, and it's not used as much and um, usually it's used in very large cases between corporations. And um, so the individual kinds of cases that are settled, there's family law mediation, uh, there's contract civil court kind of the, the disputes involving a business and an individual. So that's the reason it's so, so often used now because it works. Well, the, we, the lecture should cover chapter 10, I think I mentioned earlier. Why I'm not going to cover it is we have a whole course that you're going to take on civil litigation before trial. So I could spend hours explaining chapter 10. I do urge you to read it and to get the very, the basic kind of concepts but you're going to have a whole course that covers that. And so this is just kind of an introduction to what's involved. And I certainly urge you to read it. And um, if you have any questions to, um, to contact. Well, I'm going to conclude the week three meeting at this point.